Riley, you want to introduce your guest? <laughs> okay, great. Tidbit for the day. I'm all about. I like food. I like trying new foods. Tomorrow is National Corn Fritter Day. So y'all get your corn fritters tomorrow wherever you can find them. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. All righty. Um, prior to um, Governor Harold Domi. Uh, finishing his term, um, there was an email that went out, and I wanted to, I failed to mention this last meeting, um, where we honor and uh, respect all the Rotarians lost in the district throughout the year. We did have one of those members from our club, and uh, it was the very first one listed on the, uh, the list, and that was Mr. Richard Duval. Um, so I would like just to take a few moments of silence for those that we have, Rotarians that we have lost in the year of 2019-2020. Right, thank you very much. Anyone is interested in reviewing the necrology <laughs> report, I have it here and I can also email it to you uh, if you like. All right, next thing I wanted to mention to everyone well, uh, as well is a, a statement which came from Rotary International. This came right around, and Robert may have shared it, and I know Yvonne may have shared it, but um, we, we wanted to make sure that our Rotarians understood and, and heard a statement coming from the Rotary International with everything that's going on, etc. cetera. Uh, the first priority with, um, the pandemic and COVID is always safety. So we want our Rotarians to feel safe, to be safe, uh, and to always um, question if we can question us, if we can help you with anything that you may need during this time frame. I'm gonna read this short statement that came from Rotary International, which is for all of you to hear it, if you hadn't had the opportunity to read. At Rotary, we have no tolerance for racism, promoting respect, celebrating diversity, demanding ethical leadership, and working tirelessly to advance peace and central tenets of our work. You have more work to do to create more just, open, and welcoming communities for all people. We know there are no easy fixes, that challenging conversations, and work like before, all of, lie before all of us. Rotary strength has long been our ability and commitment to bringing people together. We will tap into that strength now as we stand with those who are working for peace and justice. Rotary will do our part to listen, to learn, and to take action to ensure that we continue to contribute to making positive change across the world. Pretty impressive. Um, I mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday, last week, regarding peace advocacy and moving, move, continue to move toward that. And um, so you probably may be hearing a little bit more of that today. So good stuff, good stuff. Another reminder is I do have some extra copies, and uh, Paul, I have a, a couple to turn into you, uh, extra copies of the 2000 program questionnaire. <laughs> If anybody has, needs one to fill out or would like to take it home and fill out and bring it later, just again, leave it in the bucket when you come into the door. We would like to hear feedback of anybody's interest regarding programs or activities or anything out that you would like to see through the year. All right, Rotary Fact. We talked about uh, what Rotary was last week. This week I want to read a little bit about the official Rotary flag. Did you all know there's, official, there's an official Rotary flag? So the official, the official flag was formally adopted by Rotary International and the 1929 convention in Dallas, Texas. The Rotary flag consists of a white field with the official wheel emblem um, 
it lies in gold and in the center of and right in the center of the field the four depressed spaces on the rim of the rotary reel are colored royal blue the words rotary and international printed at the top and bottom depressions on the wheel rim are also gold the shaft and the hub and the key weight of the wheel are white the first official rotary flag reportedly was flown in Kansas City, Missouri in January 1915. In 1922, a small rotary flag was carried over the South Pole by Admiral Richard Byrd, who was a member of the Winchester, Virginia Rotary Club. And then, four years later, the Admiral carried a rotary flag in his expedition to the North Pole. Some Rotary Clubs use the official Rotary flag as a banner at club meetings. In these instances, it is appropriate to print the words Rotary Club above the wheel symbol and the name of the city and state. You can actually have one for our club. The Rotary flag is always prominently displayed at the World Headquarters as well as at all conventions and official events of Rotary International. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Any questions? Awesome. Okay. So we've had a lot of activity go on already thus far. Um, in the beginning on the first month of July. On, on July 1st, now many of you probably know, um, we arrange, we still need to post and, and communicate, but um, Mark LeBlanc, and myself worked with the refinery and with JA and with the ARC and went and donated a ton, how many, how many? A ton of prom dresses um, which will be used and agreed upon with Janice's party and the ARC that they will, whenever the uh, JA or uh, prom night and they come and those who need and can't afford will come and be able to pick a dress and have it for free. Uh, we tried to get with JA and see if we could donate it directly to them, but they couldn't store it for whatever reason at the time and follow through. So we worked with uh, the ARC to get that done. So thank you, Mark. That was done on July 1st, the very day of this new year. On July 11th, I'd like to recognize Mr. Brady Broussard, <clears throat> Annette Mudd, uh, Garrett Thibodeau, who's not here, Madeline Dehart, we went, uh, anybody else? I think that's all, our Interact uh, Clubs. Uh, we went and donated time, thank you so much for that. This past Saturday, um, you guys donated a little bit more time than I did because I had to leave a little early. But um, we've all worked with work on a sensory project um, where uh, Zoda, is his name? Uh, Zoda Leach. Huh? Zoda Leach. Zoda and he's working on Eagle Scout, and we actually contributed funds to be able to get the supplies so he could get this project done. And it's a sensory project in an area at Eaton Park where the kids, it, it just colors and names and numbers and, and designs that they really did a lot of artwork on the floor and the walls, and we went all and paint, painted the handrails uh, for them and donated our time to that. So. Um, I want to thank you all very much for that and helping with that and all of our Rotarians for that. We will plan a field trip in the near future to be able to go and take a look at it and let Zoda explain to us what it all is exactly so you can see it. <coughs> our Rotary Satellite Club of a Million After Hours, I think that's the name. <laughs> that's the name we submitted. Uh, the first meeting for this uh, club is today. Uh, it's at 6.30 this evening at Brasso's Hardware in Maurice. Uh, and we have um, um, Jared, who will be the chairperson of this club, and um, Jonathan Lovett will be secretary slash treasurer of the club and then we will have uh, inviting as many members as we can or potential Rotarians to come to that um, this evening. So um, again, the plan for this club is they will meet once at Brasser's, once a month at Brasser's um, in Maurice 
and the second time they will meet in the month, they will rotate. How interesting is that, right? Rotary. They will rotate from city to city in the parish and meet at different areas, restaurants or wherever. So that'll be pretty cool. So I'm bringing two people, two young members. So uh, hopefully we can we can continue to bring the interest in. Maybe Father Don can help us with that too. Um, tomorrow night, so that's today. Tomorrow night, it's quite busy. Tomorrow night at Bermuda Parish School Board, we have a meeting. I invite you all to come and attend at the Marine Parish School Board. We may not be able to fit us all, but boy, wouldn't that be impressive. Mm -hmm. So I invite you all to come and attend. It's at 6 p.m. right now, tomorrow night, yeah, Thursday. Uh, at 6 p.m., Rotary, we, we will be presented an award for what we all contributed to the French Immersion Program under Robert's presidency at the Hall. So congratulations to you all. And it's for the donation of the books, particularly, is, is uh, what the award is there. I would like to take the opportunity to explain um, what, we've got, what we want to continue doing for French Immersion. So uh, I know Bernard confirmed that you're going to be coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Robert, I don't know if you're able to. Robert's going to be coming. He'll let you speak as well. What we want to continue to do for French Immersion, and I would like to present the check to them tomorrow night for what we just did this past June 20th. Yeah, at uh, Fort St. Pat's. We will be writing the French Immersion Program a check for $9,761.13. So come, come and represent. You guys all contributed and helped with that and made it a successful year and for us to be able to continue. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. There's a second award that's given out under Rob's administration. The board will be recognizing us for donating money and the services for the security projects for all high schools. And are they going to do that tomorrow night as well? I do. Awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, without further ado, I will go ahead and call up um, Paul Bourgeois, our program chair, to um, present our speaker for the day. Thank you all. Bear with me on this. Uh, I asked Father Don for maybe a couple of sentences. I've got a manuscript here going on. So I will attempt to read it. Uh, I took my mask off so I can do it. And look, I said that with humor because ever since I met this man, he has had a smile on his face and he has been a pleasure to talk to. Because I met him last year or so. We went to a friend's house for a supper and he was invited there to uh, throw holy water on all of us so we would just kind of get a little bit better taste of how things was going to go. Some of us need dashing with holy water every now and then just to keep us honest. So with that being said, and look, He's, he has a very wonderful personality. Father Don Davis Bernard was born in Lafayette, Louisiana to the, to the city of Lafayette Recreational Supervisor Don Bernard and cashier at Walmart Lisa Bernard. His pastors growing up were Monsignor Richard, Richard Mont Mouton and Father Steve LeBlanc. Kind of messed that one up a little bit there, whatever. He attended Plantation, now Corporal Middlebrook Elementary School, and then St. Pius Elementary School also. He graduated from John Paul the Great Academy in Lafayette, Louisiana. He then attended St. Joseph's Seminary College in Covington, up there where I kind of grew up on that area. Uh, and he graduated in 2015 from, and attended Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans. He was a, 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 ordained a priest in 2019 and assigned to St. Mary Magdalene and Abbeville, Louisiana. With that, I please give a very warm welcome to Father Don. Thank you. You'll notice first that there were no summa, summa cum laude on that list. <laughs> Due to my generally informal nature, I wanted to make sure that there was some formality with regards to my speech, so there you have it. 
It's very good to be here. Um, it's good to be here because uh, I'm happy to be an Abbeville. You see, I didn't know very much about Vermilion Parish. When you grow up in Lafayette, everything else just sounds like a very small town, with, you know, with whatever comes with that. Um, so growing up in Lafayette, Abbeville didn't sound much different than saying Bill Platt or from saying Ornaville or from saying, you know, it's just the way it was. However, I've been uh, pleasantly um, surprised, embarrassingly surprised, um, with the value um, and the incredible um, energy of the community here. Um, also, as a Catholic priest, with the incredible faith, um, even in the midst of so many obstacles, um, the incredible faith of the people here in Jesus Christ, for whom I represent. I believe that it's important to realize um, how many of you, just, just to show of hands, grew up Catholic? or at least to a baptized Catholic, perhaps. So as a Catholic, we read this creed um, at Sunday Mass and on feast days where we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, right? And we read this thing, and we often don't pay attention to what we're saying. There's a very important part before we bow our heads that says, for us men, right, the human family, for us men and for, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Not as an imposition, Right? Does God impose himself upon us, but for our own good and for our salvation as an invitation? And oftentimes the church right, can be misperceived as an, imposed, an imp impositional like force. Right? But for so long the church maintained the structure and the power in the Western world um, that the church, just in the recent era, has begun to transition itself um, to make sure that people know our purpose and know what it is that we're here to do. It is for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and by the power of the Blessed Virgin Mary became man. He became man because being a human being is important to God because he created us in his image and likeness. I read recently an interview with a professor who said that the reason why democracy is having a hard time right now is because our founders considered that it would always be necessary that men and women would have a moral structure and framework within which they would follow laws and without which men and women would need to be policed indefinitely and we're seeing right in our communities right that without moral foundation people simply don't have a framework with which to conduct themselves i think that's true for all of us Right? How often times do we check the rear view mirror when we're going a little too fast? And we don't mind doing so, so long as the policeman is not behind us. I think that this is important because it shows that as a, as a culture, right, religion is important. And Christianity um, is the one that I'm a part of. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my story. I'll conclude my introduction by saying, I promise I'll finish on time. Um, it's important to me to recognize something that's happened. In a recent sermon I told my community, it's become a greater compliment to call someone a Christian than to call someone a Catholic. Wouldn't you agree? Everyone's Catholic here. You know, I say, oh, he's Catholic. Oh, but look, I saw what he did last weekend, right? <laughs> oh, Father Don's Catholic, but we, you know, we see how he conducts himself, right? But everyone's Catholic. But it's important for us to see that we need to conduct ourselves like Christians, regardless of what particular faith we subscribe to. And so I want to challenge Catholics as a priest to begin to live up right to the depth of the faith that we've been given. This is an image from my first mass. Um, you might recognize the priest on the left, Father Michael Richard, who also incidentally is my fourth cousin. And um, everyone's related. And Father Michael Richard there served as well. There you go. And um, my first Mass of Thanksgiving, I realized that I wanted to be a priest for people. And that the priests that I had known in my own life had served and were some of the best men that I knew. And I looked up to them. And I wanted to be like them. And they were men that loved unreservedly. They were men that loved mankind. Simply for its own sake. You can go to the next image. And so here we go. It began. <laughs> this is one of my first weddings that I was blessed to be a part of. This is supposed to be kind of funny. 
And um, so this is the great group of brothers um, that I am blessed to share the priesthood with. A bunch of normal guys, right, that decided that they wanted to serve the Lord in a radical way. And in this wedding that we did, we decided to take a photograph and we would sort of demonstrate um, what, was, what life was about for us, right? That, like, it's not that we don't take things seriously. We take everything seriously that needs to be taken seriously. But when it doesn't, we try to enjoy life. And I think that that's true for all of us. That God does not want us to be miserable, even in serving him. God chooses for us to be joyful. This, of course, was when I got to Abbeville. Maybe you recognize some of these young faces from Vermilion Catholic's football team. I was allowed into a community that not only I could serve, but that supported me. And that was a beautiful part. You know, I thought as a priest, I would have to be holding everyone up all the time. But what I found in Abbeville is that I was being held up by others just as much as I was striving to bring them up. This is a really great picture that uh, someone took. We did these pew cards where we were trying to ascertain information um, from our communities, you know, sort of email addresses, ways to stay in touch with people. Because generally, one of my gifts is communication. And we'll get to that a little later, what happened during quarantine. Um, but a, a young child drew on this picture, a picture of what's supposed to be me, although it's taller and skinnier than I perceive myself to be. And it says, all are welcome, right? We all know that hymn, that Christian hymn, all are welcome. And my particular mission as a priest, I saw myself not as one to build up walls, right? But as one to expand the walls outward, to gather more people in. You know, I said one time when I was working out at the CrossFit gym, I said, well, Father, it's great that you can come out here and just kind of leave all of that and take a break. And I said, no, no, no. I see what I do even in my ordinary life, not as a part from my mission as a priest, but as a part of it. I see my interaction with you all, not as a part from my mission as a priest, but as a part of it. I see working out at the gym, not a part from my discipleship with Jesus, but as a part of it. And I believe that all Christians are called to that, to be truly integrated. This is uh, just a great picture of what I feel like the sort of community that I founded. Um, Josh and Aaron Thomas have become dear friends to me and their children. And it's funny, before I was a priest, I was the youngest sibling. And so interaction with children I saw as not just something that I really knew anything about. I always felt like the adults who saw the little kid and just kind of said, hey, how are you? You know, and didn't really know how to deal with young children. But when I became a priest, I saw that there was a deep hunger for healing with regards to priests and children. I saw that there was a deep hunger for people to have priests interact with their young people. That it was an area in which perhaps they had been hurt, but an area in which many people were hunger, hungering for healing. And I believe that that's been a powerful part um, of why our ministry at St. Mary Magdalene has been effective. And that's because we've been able to have an influence at Mount Carmel, right? And have an influence with the young people of Vermilion Parish. Another great image of that. <laughs> um, just... Not being afraid, right, within the proper boundaries and proper avenues to love people, regardless, right, regardless of perception. And I think that that's important for each of us. And that's something that I'm going to challenge you. Because with the end of my talk, I'll talk about what we're doing now with regards to bringing up, right, our community, raising up our community. And we cannot be afraid of perception. We cannot be afraid of how it will make us look. This was a very... Um, successful day. Um, I Give Catholic is an initiative across the, the Gulf South in which Catholic churches and Catholic organizations are invited to participate in a fundraiser, um, which is done through a singular platform. It's no secret to anyone that the Catholic Church is uh, not the foremost in technology. Um, however, we are working on it. But this was a way to sort of get parishes involved in a giving initiative. I mean, oftentimes what would happen is you would lay out a certain particular mission. Our particular mission with regards to this fundraiser was the waterproofing and sealing of St. Mary Magdalene Church, perhaps one of the most important icons of our community. St. Mary Magdalene Church, of course, this building was built in 1911. And every 10 years, we'll, we've been recommended to undergo a waterproofing of the church. 
um, a project that scales up to several hundred thousand dollars. Um, and due to the success in getting people involved and getting people invested, uh, we've been able to begin this project this year. So we thank the community for that. One of the most beautiful days um, that I've had as a priest here when, was when, so you know how they have the, the traveling, the traveling circus? We have these priests that bring us traveling. It's like a traveling circus, right? But one of the things that they do, instead of having you know a 10-foot tall man, is they bring the bones and body parts of saints. <laughs> it sounds a little <laughs> crass. However, I'll explain. We've all heard of relics. Relics, of course, are one of the stranger traditions of Catholics, um, of having something that was a piece of a bone, or perhaps a cloth of a, of a dress or a shirt of a saint, and bringing it for people to venerate. Remember what I said earlier, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And therefore God shares his life with those who he has saved. And so we venerate relics of saints, not as some force of strange idolatry, but to recognize the great dignity that God has given to us as men and women through responding to his call to holiness. So I was able to assist in having all of our young people at Mount Carmel and Vermilion Catholic venerate this relic of St. Mary Magdalene herself has been passed down to us. Um, of course, people ask, well, how do you know it's real? Well, to which I say, well, we know it's at least 1,500 years old because we can track its history, and the rest maybe perhaps takes a bit of faith. However, it was a beautiful testament to see our young people venerate and recognize the glory of the saints that God has shared with his people. I was able to attend the March for Life, which I'm very passionate about, um, in Washington, D.C. And at night, I was known to have taken young people on scooter rides, um, which was particularly something I was interested in. My dad, being uh, working in the parks my entire life, used to park his motorcycle in the gym at Domang Center in Lafayette and at Dupuy Center. Um, he would park his bike in the back closet, and then at 10 o'clock p.m., he would shut the lights off and bring his motorcycle out and drive home. Um, and so growing up in that way, I became very interested in these city scooters that Lafayette at once saw but were quickly done away with, um, to my dismay. Um, but it's growing a part of this community and being able to serve joyfully um, with initiatives that I was very excited about. This is also another strange tradition of Catholics. It's called the Blessing of Throats. The Blessing of Throats, St. Blaise was... I'm known to have had a throat ailment, and many of us, right, who deal with, have had relatives with cancer, right, feel the need to pray for particular areas. And St. Blaise, right, every year around the time that flu season is coming about, we hold candles over people's necks, and we bless in particular um, for protection of their throats. Just another really beautiful thing I was able to be a part of this past year. You see, sometimes people think the Catholic Church to sort of strip down, right, the stranger things from it in order to become more accessible. When in my opinion, it's the strange things that we need to sort of promote because that's what makes us who we are. This, again, is just an image um, of what I feel like has enabled me to be successful in this past year. And that's my brotherhood of my brother priests. Um, and I think that anyone can speak, even if you're a married person, of the need for community, what you're doing all here, the need for support. Um, this is a great weekend we were able to spend at Toledo Bend supporting one another and able to spend that time and show people that priests are simply men, right? Priests are simply humans too. And then started quarantine. I was having a very typical, sort of successful, I thought, year as a priest, but then everything came crumbling down. For the first time in many, 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 for the first time maybe ever, Masses across the world, perhaps, were not open to the public. Imagine. I mean, the Catholic Church has been around for over 2,000 years, and that's probably never happened before. Um, and so the tremendous um, difficulty of our faithful community um, in not being able to come to their Mass. And most people perhaps know that over 100 people attend our 6.30 a.m. Monday through Friday Mass. For so many of our communities, St. Mary Magdalene is a pillar um, of what it means to be a faithful disciple. So we got creative. I remember I saw a KATC. Hey, Chris, I said, what are you here to do? And he said, 
I'm here to talk about the mayor and the electricity and all this stuff. I said, no, 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 no. I said, nobody wants to hear any more about that. I said, we want to talk about good news. I said, people need good news right now. And he goes, well, what good news do you have, Father Don? I said, we got drive through confessions, <laughs> right? Right down the street. I said, what can be better than that? I said, come take a load off of your soul. Let us know what's going on with you. We'll pray over you, give you absolution. It's a great time. And you can do it from the driver's seat. You know, so many people have had perhaps negative um, experiences of church um, that I thought maybe this would be a way to bring some people back. Because if it doesn't go well, you can just drive away. <laughs> and sure enough, it was successful. Of course, I'm not permitted to tell you very much about that. <laughs> but it was uh, a beautiful time to be able to reach out to the community. You can skip ahead again. This was what Mass looked like for a few months. With an iPhone and a tripod, we were able to continue to allow our people access to Mass via YouTube and Facebook. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this is why Paul initially sort of got interested in having me speak. Um, because I think for a while, people were seeing myself and Father Louie much more than they were seeing much of anybody else. Um, because we were doing this. And believe me, it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> Uh, because when we're used to having droves of people come and respond to us and listen to us and participate in the Eucharist with us, saying Mass in front of a tripod became um, kind of tiring after a while. However, the gratitude that we received from the community was incredible. Um, people um, who perhaps maybe even haven't seen the inside of a church in years were able to say, hmm, maybe it's not that bad. Hmm. This guy's not like I remember. Interesting. Um, and I think that beyond that, even for those who perhaps didn't want to participate in that way, were able to set up their grandmother's computer and have her watch Mass. And you know what was interesting? A lot of these people hadn't been to Mass in 10, 20 years because they were shut-ins, because they were homebound. And because of a pandemic, they were able to see the inside of our church for the first time in a very long time. And I thought that was very amazing, that it took that, it took that for many people to have access to that church for the first time in a very long time. And of course, people were allowed to come back to Mass by the governor's permitting of outdoor Masses. This was kind of what I will consider to be one of the highlights of my time. Of course, we have sacred spaces for worship to take place. However, in grave circumstances, masses are permitted to take place outside. And they did. And the weather was beautiful, and people loved it, and spirits were high, and for the first time, people had some place to go. But of course, at times, we were competing with Shucks, who was having their block party across the street. <laughs> just kidding. Um, we, have a, we love Shucks. Um, but at times, of course, we'd hear the music going on. There was, there, was only, there was only one act to compete with in town, and it was Shucks at that time. Um, during those first few weeks of May. But of course things changed, we wear masks, and I've often said that I would gladly wear a clown mask if it meant that people got to come to Mass again. And finally, um, with the death of George Floyd and with everything happening within our country, we felt like we needed to open the door to communication and conversation within our community within a community in which many African Americans have been hurt, particularly within the Catholic Church. There was a Catholic African American church in Abbeville, Our Lady of Lourdes, which burned down and was never rebuilt. It's currently the Christian Service Center in which we've developed good relationships right with the community in that way, feeding the poor and feeding the needy. And through John Listy and Father Louis, we were able to open the doors to Christian leaders across Abbeville. To say, what can we do? What can we do? Right? Let's be productive, let's be constructive, and let's reach out. And with that, we formed an initiative we've been calling Vermilion Unites. Vermilion Unites is seeking to find ways that we can lend a helping hand to all of those who are in need, all of those who perhaps have been oppressed within our community. And so I invite anyone who perhaps is willing to get interest involved within that to perhaps give me your business card, to give me a phone number, and we can keep you in the loop of what we are doing with that. It's very exciting, it's very challenging, 
Because anything that takes place within the context of human relationships takes work. It's not about just building a building. It's not about just feeding people. It's about listening. It's about talking to people. Perhaps people we've been ignoring. And I think that this is very important. I'd like to allow a little bit of time for questions. Yes, sir. I just have a, a couple of comments. First of all, um, I want to thank you for your enthusiasm and for your uh, what you're doing for our community. I want to let you know it's not being on the notice, and it's a mm -hmm. breath of fresh air for us on this scene. Um, I will say that I was excited about the online masses, and I can remember one of the first weeks after not being able to go to church for a while, watching a little tally on the top. Mm -hmm. Got up to 900 and some people watching yeah. masses. We can't, fit, we can't fit 900 people in that church. Thank you. I can, I can second that motion. What kind of, I know y'all put another camera in the church. What kind of camera is that? It's not a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really what's been amazing is that we went from an iPhone on a tripod me and Paul Louie would take turns, right, saying mass each day, as we often do, um, to some very generous people who wanted to see that done better. And so we've had two cameras and a computer and a broadcasting software installed within our church um, very generously by members of our community. So we have a PTC camera, which is just a very high-quality PTC camera, which, um, and then a, sort of a security camera, which is on the wall that provides us a second view so that we can move the other camera without a very... My dad also used to have a TV show, so I think God has a good sense of humor because I was the director of the TV show from when I was 12 years old until I was 18. Um, and so I think God has a way of using our gifts, whatever they might be. Uh, for a while, you, you, uh, you would probably get the daily, the daily chat. That was, yes. that was really, really... I thought it was important for people to see people talking because for many of us, we didn't have anyone to talk to. For many of us, perhaps, especially our elderly community, it was completely shut off, cut off. And so I thought it was important, especially as we get stuck inside our own heads. A priest used to tell me, your mind is not always your friend. <laughs> and taking that seriously, I said, well, let's have conversations that people can partake in online. And so I certainly enjoyed that, and I think a lot of people benefited from it. Uh, I was lucky enough to be part of My particular and John Listy's particular enthusiasm is directed towards, we feel that God is calling us to do something for the, for the youth, for the kids um, in our community. That's the direction it seems like most of our meetings have moved in. However, I think the most important thing right now is just to have people show up to this meeting, right? To let our community, especially our black community, know that we are invested, right, in our resources, in our time, um, to making some sort of a change, to lending a helping hand. I think that's very important. So I think the most important thing right now would be to come to our meetings, right? And to say, I'm just going to listen and I'm going to see what I can do. But it seems like the direction we're heading in, um, and I think it's very possible, is something for young people. Uh, maybe it's an after school thing. Maybe it's something to teach them skills. Maybe it's something like a study hall, a place to do homework, a place to go, right? And that, that's, for, that's my passion. And I'm hoping that that's the direction it heads in. But right now, I think it's important for us to listen and to try to just see what the need is. Mason? Uh, I had the same question, Rob. Where yeah. are the meetings? The meetings, um, we're, trying to, we're going to try to meet monthly. This Saturday, we're going to have a little bit of an event at the Christian Service Center. We're calling these revivals. And what they are is it's an opportunity for all the Christian denominations, or non-Christian, um, to come together to pray. And these prayers are directed towards peace and reconciliation. And I think that the picture, the last picture I showed, right, it's a symbol. It's a symbol because it shows that this isn't a show. We've developed relationships. And that's what we're all called to do. And that's the hard part, right? Because you can't throw money at it, right? You can't just build something. Building relationships takes work. Um, but we wanted to show people that we were invested in that to see what we could do for the community. So the meetings will take place once a month. 
if you pass me your information, I will include you in the email list. We're really just getting off the ground. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but God is good, yes. I love to exercise. I love to play tennis. Um, I love to, what do I like to do, Mason? You like to eat? I do. I like to talk. I like to talk. He's very competitive. He, 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 he hates to lose. He hates I do. I really do. Um, I love to play sports. I love to exercise. I love, I love to go over to, for dinner. The best thing you could do for me, personally, would be to invite me to dinner. Yeah. I can attest to that. Minority, I have a I just had a comment. Years ago when I went to an ordination, I was really impressed by the camaraderie of the priest. The priest who was being ordained had all his friends in the seminary came. And you know, growing up in the church, you always saw the priest by himself up at the altar, by himself somewhere else. And I never even realized that until that point. I know you did on it, and maybe you want to comment on that some more. I think it's very important that people have realized that I don't see what I'm doing as me doing anything. I see it as what we are doing. Right? I think the church, and by the church I mean all Christians, need to recognize it as, as an us. Right? Just like my particular, you know what my title is? I'm a parochial vicar. What the heck is that? A parochial vicar is someone who represents the pastor. I represent Father Louis Richard in everything that I do. And in everything that he does, he represents the bishop. And so there's this great community that we just don't really promote, we don't talk about. I think a lot of priests have made the mistake of seeing themselves as lone wolves. And I think that that could become a demise for them. I've certainly become a, to their own detriment. And so I'd like to remind people and remind myself that I'm in need to be in community and that brotherhood is so important. Is following your father's footsteps in the motorcycle? <laughs> in high school and, and into my years in seminary, I did have a motorcycle, yes. Guilty. Maybe so. Maybe I could get the Hell's Angels involved with our family. Yeah. Yeah. A million unites, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Could you get the box for me in the end? Or, 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 we have a couple of tasks for you to do if you don't sure. mind. What time is it anyway?